Hello, uh, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at the American Geophysical Union Conference, the AGU Conference in New Orleans, running from December 11th through the um, 15th. And uh, what I'm in right now is one of these uh, so-called poster sessions. I've already talked about the uh, ty different types of oral talks that people give. People can have invited lectures, um, there's a, very, uh, uh, there's a few uh, sort of keynote uh, speakers. Um, Dan Rather, for example, was, an, was, was um, an example from Monday, and they'll give a talk in a very large room to thousands of people. And then in all of the different sessions, there's generally 15 minute talks, 12 minutes talk, three minutes for questions, and there's some of those are invited talks by what are considered um, extra important uh, papers um, by, by uh, well-recognized people in their field. And then there's these poster sessions and everything's going on in parallel. So you're kind of running from one to the other and it's a very massive convention center. So you're only, you know, any one person's only getting a very small fraction of the information um, that's uh, being um, presented at these conferences. So as you can see behind me, um, there, there's uh, it's a massive uh, session, uh, loads of papers. So what people do is they put together presentations, and I'll just walk through, sort of give you an idea of what's going on here. So a couple things. Uh, so there's different, all these different sections. So this is a section on planetary sciences, for example, and there's lots of different uh, posters on. Um, this one here is on comet impacts. You know, it looks at the Black Sea, for example. There's two ellipses that are oriented, and it looks like they were two different impact craters, one 60 million years ago and one 140 million years ago. Each one created the uh, crate cavity, um, you know, and it filled with water, basically. There's late-breaking uh, papers. There's uh, lots of things. This is Earth Sciences, Planetary Sciences, so there's lots of things on the uh, Mexican uh, earthquakes recently that occurred as the hurricanes were moving through. Um, there's sections on solar and atmospheric physics, heliospheric physics. Um, lots of, uh, there's magnetosphere physics, so the Earth's magnetic field surrounding the Earth, which shields the Earth from cosmic uh, from, from ionizing radiation and things. Um, whole sections on atmospheric sciences I'm passing through. One thing that surprises me is there's entire sections on the atmosphere and space electricity. So electrical discharges both high up in the stratosphere and the ones that we're much more familiar with in the lower atmosphere and the troposphere. So lightning and storms and things. Um, and I'll just continue to walk through. So these conferences are, you get your exercise, that's for sure. Um, sections on biogeosciences. So I went to a talk all about uh, how the different types of, of uh, microorganisms, microalgae and things that grow on sea ice. So as the sea ice gets thinner and thinner, there's more light transmitted through it. Uh, so there can be a lot more growth of algae right on the lower surface of the ice. Planetary surface processes, whole sections on hydrology. Um, just trying to see where the Arctic sections are. I'll just keep going. I should switch arms for holding the camera so I don't drop the thing. Hydrology. So what I went to this morning is I went to a whole session on uh, Arctic uh, sea ice and the changing atmospheric circulation patterns. Here we go, ocean sciences, paleo-oceanography, paleoclimatology, and so on. So loads of stuff. So you have to be very, you know, basically you can't come in here, you know, and just sort of wander around. Here's the cryosphere right here. So, ocean temperature, 
acidification, a lot of stuff on how do we actually measure snow depth over the Arctic sea ice, both Antarctic, Arctic zones, etc. So I'll just keep uh, walking. Global environmental change is a big section. Okay, so some of the, uh, I'll give you kind of a brief summary of some of the stuff that I saw in the talks this morning. We started at 8 o'clock. Um, so I stayed in two different Arctic sessions, about 16 talks, maybe 20 altogether on Arctic sea ice. So, uh, and, and the Antarctic as well, both sea ice and snow on the ice, etc. So, in my uh, view, from what I saw, the most significant um, thing that I was very interested in is the atmospheric circulation patterns over the Arctic Ocean and how that's changing as we get less and less sea ice and the snow cover decreases mostly in the spring on the land around the Arctic. So the normal air circulation pattern in the Arctic um, with, with the sea ice there is that in the, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very cold over the sea ice, right? The ice is highly reflective. So most of the, in the summers, the incoming solar radiation a lot of it is reflected. Also, um, you know, there's snow. When I, after, whenever it snows, then the reflectivity goes way up, right? For fresh snow, and then the I, and then if it's been a time since it snowed, then the um, ice gets darker and darker. Some of it melts out. There's melt ponds, etc. So the albedo drops, um, and there's more absorption of uh, solar radiation. So anyway, the general pattern of air circulation is that you get cold air above the ice, so you get a high pressure area. Cold air is denser than warm air. You don't get much air rising, so you get this very, very cold um, still air over the surface of the ice. So this is a high pressure region, the Beaufort High, it's called, over the Beaufort Sea. And because you have a high pressure area, you get uh, anti-cyclonic flow. Uh, if it was low pressure, it's cyclonic flow. So this is uh, flow, you know, air moves from the high pressure area to the low pressure area. It deflects to the right in the Northern Hemisphere because of the Coriolis force. So you get a circular flow, a clockwise circular flow over, over in, in the West Antarctic, over the Beaufort Gyre. Okay, it forms this uh, Beaufort Gyre, and that air motion moves the ice around in a clockwise circular pattern over the entire basin. Some of that ice goes clear across the Arctic, passes through the North Pole, and then out into the you know, Atlantic through the uh, no north of Greenland. This is the transpolar drift. So ice is exported into the Atlantic that way, and there's also ice that is drawn in uh, warm well, water is drawn in from the Pacific through the Bering Strait. So that's the typical flow patterns. Now, everything seemed to shift. There was an abrupt shift in this atmospheric circulation pattern. Um, what happened was uh, the fall and uh, the fall of 2016 was extremely warm in the Arctic. And I've had a couple of videos previously on that extremely warm and that carried into winter into January, February, March, April of 2017 of this year. Okay, so it was extremely warm. Um, so what happened is, and, and, and one of the main reasons why it was so warm is because the sea ice um, has, was, was very, very low, right? It's very thin, it's going, so there are larger areas of ocean in the Bering Strait, etc. Or, or the Chukchi, um, yeah, in the, through the Bering Strait. And uh, so the less sea ice, the warmer, the warmer, the more melting, the less sea ice, right? This, this uh, albedo feedback, very strong, powerful feedback, reducing the sea ice. So what happened was it was no longer a low, a really low, a really high pressure over the boat, over the Beaufort area. What happened is the Siberian low came more over, extended from Siberia out over the ice in that region, created, basically there was no high pressure area in that region. So as a result, 
the temperature difference um, was, uh, th there wasn't a huge, as a result, there was no blockage. As high, highs actually, actually often act as like blocking features or ridges and they stop air penetrating through. The air tends to go around, which is why the jet streams are wavy. But because there was no high pressure there over the Beaufort Sea, no Beaufort Gyre developed, and we got air incursions from the Atlantic coming far up into the Arctic Ocean. And these air incursions, or, or uh, ridges of the jet stream, brought in lots of moist air from the Atlantic and lower south. And there were lots of cyclones that were coming up. So there were lots of storms tracking all the way up into uh, from the from the eastern Arctic. This is from a North American centric view, east versus west. So um, there was a lot of uh, cyclones coming up, um, a lot of moisture carried up, a lot of heat carried up. It, it made temperatures in the Arctic 20, 30, 20, 20 degrees Celsius warmer than normal even uh, you know even 30 degrees and so on up to even 50 Fahrenheit warmer than normal for extended periods of time in the Arctic of course this did a number on the sea ice but what it also means is that the the whole air circulation patterns are are, 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 sh are shifting so this was a unprecedented event there was basically no Beaufort gyre at all the storm tracks were bringing warm moist air from the Atlantic. So, um, so this is a this was a very significant paper. You know, we if you follow um, the science, you might remember how warm it was. But this is this is really a break from the circulation patterns in the past, and of course, this has global implications. Um, in an interview, which I have to track down from 2010, I was quoted. I was on this TV interview, I think it was Global News or something in Ottawa, and uh, I was just being interviewed about the Arctic sea ice and stuff, this is seven years ago, and uh, I said, you know, I came up to it, I came up with this phrase during the interview, sort of just spontaneously, you know, what happens in the Arctic, I think I'd been on a trip to Las Vegas, so I said, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, it's not like Las Vegas. Um, and uh, I remember the, 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 the uh, photographer, the filmer, the, the newscaster, whatever, said, hmm, that's a, you know, really like the quote, so that's kind of catchy. So at that point, I, I probably, I should have trademarked it because it's very commonly used now. You know, it's a good phrase. So, so this is, uh, an, so with this Beaufort gyre shift, what it, what it means is it's another, it's really a big quantum leap or a threshold is being crossed or a big phase shift or call it what you want. Uh, but it, it's a reorganizing of the jet stream, uh, the root cause being the greatly warming Arctic and the changing thermodynamic properties of the ice, you know, where the ice is, how little ice there is, so the temperatures above get much warmer, so the rotation, the general rotation pattern, instead of having an anticyclone, you have really um, a ridge coming right up over that region. So you get a uh, flow uh, that is, you know, you get flow in a ridge, but it's basically from west to east. Um, and uh, so, the, so the patterns, the patterns are all shifting, right? And uh, you know, this makes perfect sense that when we change the thermodynamic properties um, faster in one region than in other regions, that the entire patterns will shift. So. Um, in a lot of these talks, I do ask the question, okay, so where are we going? I try to get people to, I try to pin down people and say, you know, when do you think we'll have the first uh, September with uh, no, essentially no sea ice? Um, and uh, nobody, nobody wants to answer that question. Everybody says, well, I haven't really studied that. I'd just be, you know, speculating or guessing. And, you know, I point out, well, your speculation or guess is probably much better than most people's speculation or guess because you spend your life uh, studying the ice. So can't you just, uh, you know, this is important to the world. Can't you just come up with a number? And, you know, it, people are reluctant to do that. Um, generally, some people will go and, you know, quote the models, say 2040, 2050, 2060. And when I say it's 2020 possible, there, there's like silence. Anyway, thanks for listening.